by a show of hands, how many of you have heard the claim that we only use 10% of our brain? Wonderful. So I'm going to tell you how this claim shaped my research in neuroscience. But first, a story. About 10 years ago, I was uh, walking in the main road at Caltech when I suddenly saw a sign on a billboard that said that they're looking for help. And this was a big Hollywood studio. And they were looking for scientists to help them put the science in a TV show. You know, sometimes you watch TV shows and there's a doctor who says, hey, quick, we need to put a 40 milligram of propofol. Then some scientist actually has to read the script and put the 40 milligram in there. And that's what they were looking for. So I took this job. And since then, I've been involved with a number of Hollywood films and TV series, helping them put the science. And Hollywood has been great for science in the last decade. They've been putting a lot of science in many, many films. But the specific one I want to tell you about happened about three years ago. I got a call from a friend of mine. His name is Mark Goffman, and he's been a writer on many TV shows like The West Wing, Sleepy Hollows, and many others. And he called me and he said, I'm working on a show called Limitless, based on the film, and I need your help. Now, if you don't know anything about this TV show, the premise is that there's this unique pill that someone can take, and if you take it, it enhances your mental faculties, you have more IQ, you become a superhuman brain-wise, and in every episode, the hero takes the pill and uses this smarts that he has to solve crime and helps people, but there's also an arc to the entire series, which is the hero tries to figure out how the pill works. And they called me because they had no idea how it's going to work. And they said, we're already in episode number eight. We have about uh, 15, 16 more, and we need to find out how it's going to work. Come up with an answer. <laughs> now, I should tell you that I came up with a really cool answer, but I don't want to spend the next 15 minutes talking to you about fake science. I'd rather tell you about my real work. So all I can tell you is that they were so excited about this solution that they said, you know what, we're going to actually keep it to season two, and that's going to be the reveal, and then the show got canceled. So you're never going to get to see it. <laughs> you can ask me afterwards. But in the course of trying to find out how the pill could work, I started looking online at all kinds of blogs and comments from fans and what they said about it. And that's when I started seeing conversations about this idea that we only use 10% of our brain. There are also some people selling the fake pill online, but it doesn't exist, just to be clear. <laughs> Science fiction. But in looking at the conversation, I started to get alarmed because this is absolutely not true. All of our brain is being used. So I asked myself, why is this claim coming out? And it's, in my mind, something that aligns with many other myths about the brain that are all not true. But they emerge because people have this desire to enhance their brain. We want more. Even though I've never heard anyone saying that they're not happy with their brains, people say that they're not happy with their looks, but no one is complaining about their brains, we still have this desire to get more of it. And I think that the reason for that is that even though all of our brain is being used, we have access and control over only certain small parts of it. Most of the things that our brains do happen under the hood without us having any control over them. Right now, when I speak to you, my brain regulates the temperature in my body, it uh, plans what I'm going to say next. A lot of things happen in the brain, and I don't know any of them. In fact, if we try to look at the brain like a pie chart, then this Pac-Man part of the pie chart is the part of the brain that we have no control over. We only have control over a small, uh, limited part of our brain, and this is by design. This is so that we won't make mistakes and ruin things that our brain is equipped to do in itself. In fact, if I wanted to do something to change in this part of the brain that is not uh, under my control, it would be really hard, nearly impossible. Right now, uh, when I look at you, information from uh, the retina goes to the back of my brain, gets processed there, information about color, orientation, shapes, all of that gets aggregated, and then it becomes an image that emerges in my mind. And I get to see this image only at the end, after all the processing happened. And I can't change that. If I decided that I want to see the world in black and white, it won't happen. Even though it's my brain that puts the color in it, I can't somehow turn it off. So being a former hacker, I asked myself, 
is there a way in which we can actually get access to the other part of the brain and change things there? Now, because of this cascade that ends with us knowing things, in order to get backwards, we would need to somehow open the brain and put wires to go all the way in the areas that we have no access to normally to change things. So we would have to actually put wires in a human being's brain. And that's what I'm here for, to look for volunteers for this. <laughs> no. The reality is that I'm part of a small team of scientists who are doing that for the last 15 years. What we've been doing is working with patients who undergo brain surgery and allow us to put electrodes inside their head and learn something about the ongoing of the inside. So the way it works is people that have all kinds of unique brain disorders that need a surgery show up to the hospital. The surgeon then exposes their brain and put electrodes inside in the surrounding area where the problem should be, and then connects those to a computer. And we start recording the brain activity continuously while we wait for the patient's problem to manifest itself. And when it does, we can actually see exactly where the origin is, take the wires out, resect the part of the brain that causes the problem, close everything, and send the patient away fixed. That's the clinical part. But this also gives an opportunity for researchers like myself to study them, ask them questions about their feelings and emotions, what they care about, and see how the brain works from within. Give us access to the vault of your identity. Okay. So now, we can actually maybe start poking in the back and giving people access to the parts of the brain that normally they have no access to and see if they can learn to control more of their brain. So Neuroscience 101, if you were to zoom into a person's brain, what you would see inside is a forest of little cells that we call neurons. And those cells speak in an electrochemical language that if we translate into audio, would uh, sound something like the firing of a machine gun. And this is the sound of one cell speaking to another and telling it, I care about something in the world. If we know what happened in the world when this particular cell fired, we can actually know what this cell codes for. Show the patients all kinds of images on the screen and listen to various cells in their brain to see which cell lights up when an image appears so we know what the cell cares about. I'm going to show you now an example from this one patient. What you see on the screen are the images that she's seeing. What you hear is the sound of one cell in her brain. Try to think if you can tell what this cell codes, what makes it tick. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. This is one cell out of a small cluster in this woman's head that fires when she thinks of Marilyn Monroe. And in fact, if you guys know who Marilyn Monroe is, it means that right now in your brains, there were cells like this one that light up when you saw this image. This is what thinking of everyone all looks like inside their brain. So when we find cells like this in people's brain, Mary Monroe, the Eiffel Tower, the Big Ben in London, their best friends, their mom, their dad, cells that code all kinds of things, we can start trying to do the thing I mentioned earlier, which is give the patients access to the parts of the brain that normally they have no access to and see if they can change something there. So the first thing I wanted to do is see if by giving access to the back of the brain, we can teach the patient to actually activate those cells that normally they have zero control over. In the following way, we told the patient, we're going to put a picture on the screen in front of your eyes, and that's a picture of something, doesn't matter what, it's a distractor. We want you to look at this thing, but in your mind, think about Marilyn Monroe. We want you to override the image that your eyes propose with your mind's eye. As in, think Marilyn Monroe and override the things that your mind tries to make you see. The patient sits there and starts summoning the thought in her mind. And to our surprise, within seconds, could actually show Marilyn Monroe in her mind. Now, to know that it's true, we actually had to listen to the cell and send it fires. And to make it easier for the patient, we told her, you know what? If you're doing a good job in actually activating those cells in the back of your brain, we're going to make the image of Marilyn Monroe appear on the screen gradually, so you will get positive feedback that you're doing the right thing. So effectively, we're projecting her thoughts on the screen when she's able to access the part of the brain that normally you and I cannot get to. With our patients, we did it with various other pictures. A friend of the patient uh, is on the screen. She thinks of a banana. She sees a picture of the pyramids in Giza, but is asked to ignore the images and see on the screen a picture of Michael Jackson, and it works in the same way. 
And the point is, right now, with electrodes in the back of her brain, she learned how to activate networks that you and I can only experience after they become a thought in our mind. And this is not just a remarkable thing, it actually answers something that a lot of us have been thinking about for a while. Who wins? Our senses or our mind? There is a lot of spiritual conversation about the fact that, you know, our mind creates the world, our eyes and our senses just propose things, but it's actually our internal thoughts that create reality. Well, here's the poof. We can train you with little feedback into the back of your brain on how to control the world. So this was the first test, which allowed us to actually give people access to parts of the brain that normally they don't have access to. But thoughts and memories are actually the closest thing to our conscious awareness. So we asked, can we go further back into parts that you really have little access to, like your emotions? So emotions are something that we can control to an extent, but most of the time emotions kind of dawn on us. We don't really say, you know what, my mom is sick, I should uh, feel sad, so let's turn on sadness for a while, feel sad for 10 minutes, okay, turn it off, now feel happy. It doesn't work like this. Emotions happen to us and we're just experiencing what's going on. We take our brain and our brain gets exposed to a snake and fear emerges. With our patients, we said, we're going to do something else. We're going to put electrodes in the part of the brain that governs your emotions and we're going to show you some images that will make you feel something. In this example, for instance, something that's going to make you feel joy. We want you to first look at the clip and just feel whatever it makes you feel. And then we're going to show you the same clip again, and this time we're going to ask you to try to suppress your feeling. Here we go. <laughs> this never fails. But for you, it's going to be much harder right now to look at the clip again and again and not feel anything. But with the patients, because we give them feedback for the part of the brain that controls the joy that this film elicits, we can actually train them with feedback to gradually learn how to overcome this feeling and just suppress it entirely. So with eight of our patients, we could take the activity of the neurons when they watch the clips and watch them over time decay to a level that allows us to essentially see how we can control our emotions. In the last five years, we've been doing a lot of those experiments. We taught patients how to control their conscious awareness, their memories, their emotions, even their breathing. We went as back in the brain as to the primal parts of the brain that we share with all kinds of animals. And we said, can we do something even in those parts that you're never supposed to be accessing? And what we saw was that with little feedback, our patients could even learn how to change the synchronicity between areas that control their breathing. And the point is that we're gradually, over time, learning to get access to more and more of our brain. Granted, these are patients with open brains and electrodes inside, not you and I. But science tells us that if we're getting a proof of concept, if we see that something works and we learn how it works, then it becomes an engineering problem that we can gradually improve upon. So presumably, in the next couple of years, we're going to learn how to get more and more of our brain. Maybe we can expand our brain, get to increase our IQ, increase our abilities. And this is where I think things become profound and I want to highlight them. If we increase our abilities, we might change entirely the way nature is meant for us to work. You know, the smartest monkey out there has an IQ equivalent of human's IQ of 70. If 100 is the average person and 140 is a genius, then this monkey that can communicate and uh, do basic arithmetics is said to have the IQ of about a two-year-old kid. And we're really impressed by that. We say, oh my god, this is an amazing monkey. It can do all kinds of impressive things, but we're not trying to be the friends of this monkey or you know, treat it like a peer. If we started to expand and give humans these abilities, IQ of 150, 200, maybe 1,000, what will these new humans think about us? Will they want to be our friends, our peers, or treat us like we treat the monkey? Saying, oh my god, look at this smart one, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> it looks like a two-year-old Timmy here. It can do all kinds of uh, differential equations in its mind. It's amazing. <laughs> 
this is the world we're playing with right now. Neuroscientists are not equipped to think about these problems better than any of you. And what I learned from looking at the people who've been trying to explore what it would mean when they thought about ideas for limitless is that humans are very greedy when it comes to expanding our brain. We all want more. I recently watched an episode of Simpson, and Homer Simpson speaks to Mr. Burns there, and tells him, Mr. Burns, you're the richest guy I know. And Mr. Burns says, and I will give it all up for a little more. <laughs> and that is how we've been treating our brain recently. Learning how it works, but constantly trying to expand upon it and get more and more of it. And with the expansion of our brain, also is the expansion of our duty. And for this, we need 100% of our collective brains. So next time someone comes to you and tells you that they heard that we use only 10% of our brain, the answer you should give them is, well, I guess you do. <laughs> Thank you so much.